exciting stuff. We have um, oh, over 100 people that are with us, members of the public today. Your elected officials are here to listen with you. Obviously, they're very busy people. So I assure you, even myself, we support the committees for land use changes here at the council. Um, we are listening. We have DCP. Department of City Planning listening here, and they're going to give us a presentation um, to get really into the, the crux of what we're talking about here. We also have um, the MTA here listening as well. So a little bit of how it's going to work. There's a QA and a um, under the, it, it might say more at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can click on those three buttons and you'll see the Q&A and you can pop that out. We received a lot of comments and questions that we'll, we'll get to in the Q&A session after DCP's presentation. Um, but you can also look for answers to some of the questions that are coming up in the Q&A uh, portion of the Zoom at, as we're going as well. Um, so with that, I think we are good to, well, actually, sorry, one last thing. I just wanna make sure we did mention there are gonna be more events coming. Everyone who's here today, we have your email. We will be following up with more information. Um, you can also, there's not a lot on our website right now, but if you go to council, um, council.nyc.gov slash land use, um, we'll be posting all the information there. We'll also be putting links up to DCP's website, MTA's website. So we will be giving you a wealth of information over the coming months. Um, and now with that, I will kick it over to DCP for the presentation. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, so my name is Lara Marita. I am Senior Director for Community Planning and Engagement at DCP. Um, I am here with my uh, colleagues in the Bronx office, um, Tuan Duling and Alexandra Pati Diaz. Um, and we are gonna go over a lot of information that you've already made, many of you have may, may have seen, um, but we wanna make sure that we're able to be able to show you the, um, the work that's been done and what are the steps that we're looking at going forward. I first off wanna really thank the borough president Gibson, council member Salamanca, council member Riley, Fadia, council member Farias and council member um, Velasquez. We really appreciate you convening this tonight and um, really creating another space for us to really talk about a really important project that we've been working with in the community with over the years. Um, and with that, I want to make sure we spend enough much time to be able to have a discussion. So I'm going to hand it over to Tun, who will go over the um, will go over the uh, PowerPoint with us. Great. Yes. <clears throat> Wait for this to load up. But then, um, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome, and thank you all for attending tonight's session. It's great to see such a good turnout for this event. Uh, my name is Tone Dooling, and I'm a senior planner in the Department of Cities Plan City Planning's Bronx office. And tonight, as was mentioned before, we'll provide an overview of the planning work to date and outline next steps, including the upcoming public review process known as ULERP, uh, and that is expected to start at the end of this year. Next slide, please. Um, so here's an outline of the presentation that we'll go over. Uh, tonight with you all. Uh, I'll first give a recap of the planning process. So it started back in our work around land use, housing, public space improvements, as well as workforce development. And then we'll wrap up this Hey, Tune, you're going in and out. Um, we're having a technical presentation use chain planning work, ULERP, which is both before and during the public review process. Sorry, Tun, you're um you're kind of going in and out a little bit. So apologies to all for the the audio. I'm going in and out. Yeah. Is this better? Or yeah, I just got a notice on the DCP site that uh our our network is unstable for DCP staff. Can you hear us? Sorry. We can hear you now. All right. Um, where, where, did, where did you lose me? And I'll back up a little bit. Bringing the plant to life. We're... Bringing the plant to life. Okay. Um, where was I? Okay. So first, a recap of the planning process and then about how community engagement informed our work around land use, housing, public space improvements, as well as workforce development. And then at the end, we'll wrap up the presentation by giving a brief outline of ULERP. Uh, that's the public review process for important land use changes. 
but also mention other ways for you to stay involved, both before ULERP starts and uh, getting updated about the planning work during ULERP. Uh, next slide, please. So we'll first start with the with a quick recap of the planning process till now. Um, next slide. So while we officially launched the Bronx Metro North study in the summer of 2018, the study has its origins in even earlier work. And that was part of the sustainable communities in the Bronx uh, work that was published in 2014 after a multi-year planning process with the community and many others. So this means that our planning work reflects a decade of planning and around and engagement around regional rail service, the Metro North service, uh, at the future Morris Park, Park Chester Van Nest, Co-op City, and Hunts Point stations. And over the years, we've met with you, many of you in person, whether out at St. Raymond's Elementary School, uh, to envision together what a renewed East Fremont Avenue might look like, or virtually in the heart of the pandemic to speak with the community about draft recommendations and understand what might be missing. Next slide, please. So here you can see a broad timeline of the planning work and really focusing on all the community engagement that was done over the years and that has um, um, uh, informed our thinking. And as you can see, there were workshops, open houses, and also um, uh, in-person and remote info sessions during the pandemic, uh, focusing on different station areas over the years. And these events were, of course, opportunities to provide input, shape the recommendations for the future, uh, but also to get updates from city planning, like, uh, for example, tonight, uh, and our project partners uh, like the MTA, who is here tonight as well. Um, and then focusing a little bit on recent events, uh, we had two virtual info sessions in December 2022, so a little, little less than a year ago. Uh, and we did scoping for the environmental review process back in January of this year. Uh, and that focused on the proposed land use changes around Park Chester Van Nest and the Morris Park station area. And engagement continued throughout the spring and summer this year. And again, we expect to start ULERP, the public review process for the land use changes around these two stations in Park Chester Van Nest and Morris Park uh, later this year. And then the focus will shift more toward public review and then um, uh, implementation and that all uh, of course, is the planning work centers around the new train station and the train service that will be provided by the MTA and is expected to start in 2027. Next slide, please. So over the years, what what, what have we heard from you? Um, well, what, what we have heard is a desire for better or for new open spaces in these areas and a desire for improvements to roadways and traffic circulation, particularly at Morris Park, but also elsewhere. Uh, we've heard concerns about the impact of any changes on residents and existing businesses in the area. But also a desire for more ways to get around the community, uh, new forms of mobility, such as uh, bike lanes and a pilot scooter share program, but also a hope for more kinds of places to be together uh, as a community and to relax in your own neighborhood. Uh, and this is only some of what we've heard over the years. There's a full breakdown of all the past events and the recommendations. Uh, on our website that you'll be able to access after this uh, meeting as well. Uh, next slide. So you can see like there's like a whole breadth of, of information and engagement th that we had, but to structure our thinking, we've grouped our recommendations for these areas into four categories for each of the uh, uh, three categories for each of the four uh, station areas. And these topics are vibrant communities, connected communities and working communities. And for vibrant communities, it was really about the question, how do we plan for growth while celebrating who we are and who we are as a community? And this touches on everything from housing and jobs to open space, schools and area history, uh, among other topics. And then connect to communities. It's very much about how do we plan to help people get around the neighborhood, the city and the region. And this touches on everything from sidewalk connections to roadway improvements and just taking full advantage of the Metro North surface coming online in 27. And the, the final one is working communities and how do we plan to grow jobs and connect wrong sites to them. Next slide. So here you can see just in one image, everything that goes into a neighborhood planning process. And that's really everything again, from parks to connections and housing and also workforce development and parks. Next slide, please. So before we jump into how we plan on bringing the planning work to life and, and what we've heard, uh, we want to share the two below visions. Um, 
here on, on your left and right of the screen that were developed throughout the plan process for the two stations where we are proposing land use changes. That's Park Chester Van Nest and Morris Park. And the first one, the one on your left, on the left side of the screen, shows an East Fremont Avenue that is inviting, safe, and comfortable to walk along, and that adds key additional open space and that allows for additional housing and community serving uses, such as retail, but also community uses near the Park Chester Van Nest Station. And the second one, the image on your right, shows a future Morris Park station area that includes a new world-class plaza space. And that itself actually was developed following early recommendations issued by the community, by you and your neighbors back in 2018, and surrounded by a district that allows for a mix of housing, retail, and community facility uses that together create a new gateway to this important Bronx job center. And these are just some of the visions for the future around the station areas. And we look forward to continuing the work with the community and with stakeholders and elected officials uh, to shape that vision further. So continued engagement. And as I mentioned, like after our info sessions back in December of last year, we continued to have conversations with you, with your neighbors and other stakeholders to hear from you and to inform our planning work. And so we went out to community boards. We had conversations with several neighborhood organizations and also had a table at a recent DOT event, the Department of Transportation, a summer event to talk to you about our ongoing planning work. Next slide. Um, and aside from these bigger conversations and meetings, we also continue to do online outreach to give everyone updates on the planning work and on what is next. And we're active on social media, uh, we have a comprehensive web page and we send out a monthly email blast and more information here on the screen about how to sign up for that. And also just want to point out the remote office hours. There's really an opportunity for someone who wants to chat with us one-on-one -on -one that you can sign up there. And we have time available usually on Tuesdays and Wednesdays where you can have an, where you have an opportunity to ask questions and have a focused conversation with city planning staff, including myself. Um, next slide. Um, and one way to implement the community-driven recommendations is to make land use changes, and particularly through zoning. So now we'll discuss the land use objectives and vision for uh, two stations, uh, the Park Chester Van Ness Station, Morris Park Station, and those objectives and that vision came out of community engagement throughout the years. And our planning work identifies public space improvements, and our workforce development work does also cover the Hunts Point and Co-op City. Uh, station areas, but no land use changes are proposed there. Next slide. So here you can see the Park Chester Van Ness station area, and the station area here really centers around East Tremont Avenue that runs east-west, sort of from left to right on your screen. And the new train station will sit more or less in the middle between White Plains Road and Unionport Road to the west, and Bronxville Avenue to the east. And East Tremont Avenue, that's what we've heard throughout community engagement, has really divided the Park Chester community to the south from neighborhoods to the north, including the Van Ness and Morris Park neighborhoods. And the community driven vision for this area is to create an active corridor there that ties them together along East Fremont Avenue. And specifically the vision that was developed over the years is to promote fair transit oriented development that benefits all residents, but also to encourage the development of a mixed use and walkable district around the station. Um, and the main corridor that runs like between the new station and Park Chester, but also to respond to the context of the surrounding neighborhoods um, at different densities, uh, as well as to encourage welcoming connections throughout the neighborhood to really better connect that future station with the surrounding residential neighborhoods. And finally, to ensure quality site planning on large sites near the new station. Next slide. So one of the tools available to us to implement community-driven recommendations and to realize that vision is through land use changes. And here you can see the proposed project area for those land use changes with the yellow outline. And as you can see, the area sticks close to East Fremont Avenue and the new train station that sort of sits in the middle. And so based on that vision, the land use objectives that were identified and formulated through community engagement, uh, are as follows, as like some little housing exists here today is to allow for new housing, uh, especially near the new train station along the key corridors, also to take full benefit of the new transit service. And when allowing for housing is to also require the inclusion of permanently affordable housing in those developments, but also to allow for local retail and other services along those corridors that strengthen those corridors. Um, yeah, and again, uh, to provide controls to shape development, but also create open space on the larger sites that are within this area. Next slide. 
And here you can see the Morris Park station area. Uh, and this station area centers around East Chester Road. It runs north south. So here the north is on the right hand side of your screen. So it's 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 shifted, uh, and the south is on the on on the left side of your screen. Um, so the new train station will sit approximately in the middle of that area between Pelham Parkway to the north, so on the right hand side, and Williamsbridge Road to the south, where it connects with East Chester Road. And what you can see here is like also a culmination of a vision for tying together different institutional campuses. You can see the health campus here from uh, Albert Einstein, College of Medicine, Montefiore, and uh, Jacoby uh, Health and Hospitals, um, uh, as well as residential neighborhoods and like the Hutch Metro Center on the other side of the rail line. And the vision is really to tie those all together and, and, and taking full benefit of the new regional rail service there um, uh, and to create a, a world-class jobs campus here in the Bronx. So the vision developed over the years entails to create a new neighborhood center that support transit-oriented development, area institutions, and jobs growth, um, but also to ensure uh, comfortable station access and to sort of bridge the divide that the rail line currently creates, and again, to promote residential growth and local retail along the key corridors uh, and to encourage welcoming connections. Next slide. Uh, so again, you can see the project area outlined in, in yellow here for the for the land use changes, and again, like the vision that was that was created and, and and shaped over the years translates into a number of land use objectives for this area. And again, in an area that where housing is not allowed today uh, by zoning and most of the what you see here outlined in yellow is to allow for new housing to take benefit of the new train service. Uh, and again, to um, uh, make sure that affordable housing is included in those developments as well. And here, what is a little different from what we talked about for Park Chester Van Ness is to support the growth of educational, health and life science sectors in Morris Park, as it's such an important job center for the borough and for the, for the city at large. Uh, next slide, please. So I've just spoken about some of the ways that we aim to bring the community's vision for housing and retail and other uses to life, but that's only one part of the planning work. Uh, another part that's true for all four station areas is that we're uh, looking at ways to, to better connect the neighborhoods, the surrounding neighborhoods with the station areas and to make sure that you're able to access the places that are important to you in your everyday life. Next slide, please. So we've heard a lot over the years about the community's vision for a more walkable uh, and more pleasant and more inviting network of public spaces and pathways. And this has included everything from concerns about poorly lit underpasses, which you see in the top left, as well as a bigger vision for new or expanded open spaces, but also just um, wheelchair accessibility and better sidewalks. Next slide. So we've heard a lot about needed improvements over the years and among the desired improvements about uh, near Park Chester Van Ness Station were improved sidewalks, pedestrian crossways, and just in general, better pedestrian crossings north and south and along Bronx Hill Avenue. And on the left is our vision of a new uh, East Fremont Avenue at the new train uh, station entrance uh, with safer conditions for pedestrians coming to and from the station, uh, especially from the Park Chester community. So on the right hand side of your screen and from the station and improved circulation. Uh, and the image on the right is what we envision for a future Bronx Hill Avenue and other streets that just need improvements that are more safe and attractive for pedestrians. Um, then we move to Morris Park. Um, here, again, the station presents opportunity to tie together the job center and to better connect with the surrounding neighborhoods and creating a quality network of open space and public pathways will be essential to make sure the residents, workers, and visitors to the area's medical and educational facilities can comfortably get to and from the new train station. An important part here is also uh, a new plaza space, and we've also worked with the MTA and other and property owners in the area to include a connection that connects the east and the west side of the train line together so that people can get to work or go home after um, their commute more easily. So this will be at the new station. And these are what you can see along East Chester Road on the right-hand side of your screen. I think we, the images, yeah, there we go. All right, and one important part is that 
aside from um, additional improvements to streets, is like one of the most illustrative examples where public input really matters and the continued coordination with state and city agencies like the MTA really matters is the plaza, the proposed plaza is Morris Park. Um, and this comes from early public comments about the need for additional open space near the station. And over the years, the study team has worked with the community and with those agencies uh, to bring to life a vision for that plaza that would really tie in uh, the new station with the surrounding area and the Morris Park neighborhood that's located further west. Next slide. Uh, and then uh, the work, the focus of our work at Co-op City is to improve accessibility uh, to and from the different sections of Co-op City and the future Metro North Station. And here you can see a vision of a more pedestrian friendly and a safer station area uh, that will be at the intersection of Erskine Place and the Reimer Avenue uh, here like to the south of Co-op City. And for Hunts Point, Hunts Point is already benefiting from ongoing planning work as part of EDC's Hunts Point Forward Plan. And city planning's work here is also focused on bringing stakeholders and agencies together to address pedestrian connection challenges between Del Valle Square and the new train station, as you can see here on the screen. Um, and then a, a, a different topic in our work is to is workforce development and bringing four new Metro North stations to the Bronx creates an important opportunity for Bronx residents. Uh, not only will the new stations will 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 they strengthen connectivity and improve access to more jobs, both points north of the city as in Midtown. We're also very excited to be part of a workforce development process and to center Bronx sites throughout the borough in this work. Next slide. So the three goals that guide our efforts are to strengthen and focus on job centers around the new train stations, but also to increase regional access to jobs, which will give Bronx residents more options and opportunities to participate in diverse sectors, both in the city and in Westchester and Connecticut. And also to connect and prepare Bronx sites for good jobs around those new job centers. Next slide. So how do we prepare and set up Bronx sites for success in a growing economy and with the new rail service? And what does that look like? And it really requires that we have a good fundamental understanding of the needs of the community and of the labor force and also by of employers by doing research and engaging them throughout the process. So that's what we've been doing for the last uh, year. And this initial work will lead up to an action plan. And that's like really a roadmap that outlines how to guide Bronx sites to new opportunities and growing sectors and connecting them to jobs and existing and new workforce development programs. And that really to better position them in, in the economy. Um, next slide. So what is next? Um, we'll now shift our focus to the upcoming public review process for land use changes. And that's called ULERP. Uh, in New York City. Next slide. So ULERP, um, you might hear that a lot. It stands for Uniform Land Use Review Process, and that's the review process by which land use proposals get adopted. Uh, the Bronx Metro North Station Area Plan is expected to enter the city's formal public review process for land use approvals in late 2023. And then the community boards, the Bronx Borough President and Borough Board, City Council, City Planning Commission, and others will host public meetings and weigh in on the plan. Next slide, please. So what kind of materials uh, can you expect to be reviewed during ULERP? What's really at the center of it all? It's like taken together, we call these materials a land use application package. Um, and here you can find information as to who is proposing the actions. And for this uh, specific project, that would be city planning. Uh, but also what kind of land use actions are proposed. For example, changing the zoning that currently allows for commercial manufacturing uses to allow also for housing. Um, but also like why are these actions requested or like what, why are they applied for? And in this case, it's very much to plan for transit-oriented development and to strengthen commercial corridors to better connect existing neighborhoods with the new stations. And finally, where is it located? And here, as I mentioned before, for the land use changes that we'll be focusing on the area around the new Park Chester Van Ness and Morris Park stations. Next slide. So before an application enters ULERP and goes to all the different ULERP players that you see outlined here on the screen from left to right, um, there's something that's called certification. And certification means that the City Planning Commission determines that the application that will be discussed and reviewed and talked about is complete and ready to review. So certification is really to make sure that the materials are correct, are accurate and complete, um, just to make sure that, you know, the public and the representatives when they weigh in on it, they are 
uh, they can rely on, on good, good information. Um, next slide, please. So within ULERP, um, the order of who gets to review the application and how much time uh, each of them has is set. So what we call sort of the ULERP clock starts at certification, and then each decision maker uh, has a certain amount of time to review, to hold a, a public meeting and make a decision about how they feel about the proposal. For example, here you can see that the community boards and for Metro North that will affect community boards 9, 10 and 11. Those community boards have 60 days to, um, yeah, to consider the proposal and, and, and share their recommendation. Um, and then it moves on to the borough president and the borough board, and then it moves on to city planning commission, city council, and finally the mayor before ULERP is completed. Um, next slide, please. So what do community members and decision makers, what can they do with the land use application and with the material throughout that process? So the applicant, and again, in this case, that's the Department of City Planning, gives a presentation about what is proposed. And then the decision maker, for instance, the community board holds a public hearing uh, to hear from residents, from local businesses and other stakeholders um, about how they feel about what is proposed. And the focus of this public review process is very much to see um, like how what is proposed aligns with the vision of the, of the community. Um, and community boards, the borough president and the borough board, they all issue an advisory recommendation at the end of their review. Uh, at the same time, City Planning Commission and City Council have a binding vote about what is proposed. Next slide. So ULIP is expected to start in late 2023. And here in the next two slides, we outline the available options for you to stay involved and to receive updates before, but also during ULIP. Uh, and again, we're active on Instagram and social media. We also send out an email blast, uh, usually uh, monthly. You can sign up by emailing us. Uh, there's a website with materials. There's actually also a short video uh, explaining ULERP. Uh, uh, um, again, like on our website that you can look at. But also, uh, feel free to sign up for the remote office hours. There's a sign up link right here in the presentation that you can use for that. And I think that brings us to the end of our presentation. And I can only say, on behalf of all of us at DCP, look, thanks for attending and listening to the presentation. And also thanks to City Council and the Bronx Borough President for hosting tonight's event. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, and Mario, are you available to, I just want to put the pull the slide up that has our upcoming events um, while we still have over 120 people on. Yeah. Sure awesome. Enough. Okay, so great, thank you. Um, so we do have some upcoming events this fall. This is just the first to come. We are planning to do a few more, but just so folks can um, save the dates on these, we have three in-person events scheduled. One for October third. That's going to be at PS one hundred six. We're going to focus on um, the engagement around the uh, DCP's planning proposal for to create more housing and jobs in Parkchester, Van Ness, and Morris Park. Um, then we'll have one in Co-op City on October 16th from um, 6 to 8 p.m. I'm sorry, we don't have the times on here. They're all from 6 to 8 p.m. Um, maybe somebody can just ask that question in the chat and we'll answer that um, to get that information on there. And then we also have the Hunts Point event um, from 6 to 8 on October 18th. Um, the Co-op City and Hunts Point events will focus more on the, the station planning, um, whereas the Parkchester Van Ness will be a little more expansive and related to everything that Tun just went through. All right. So with that, um, you can take that slide down. We'll also share all of this information with you via email and many links. Um, we're going to begin our Q&A session. Um, so... We have a lot of questions that came in. I have maybe about 30 that came in before um, before we started tonight. And then we've got a we've got a bunch. We've got a bunch that have been answered already. So definitely check those out. Um, we're going to put together an FAQ that goes all over all of this. Um, so let's just let's jump right in. Um, we got a lot of questions asking about how this project will affect parking and traffic, um, especially in Co-op City, but also in Morris Park and Parchester and Van Ness, um, and also concerns about people driving in from Connecticut or um, north of the city. 
and you know parking on taking the street parking around the stations um to just get to to Manhattan closer so can um we have Joe we have Joe from the MTA on um Joe can you well actually I'm not sure if this is a great question for the MTA or for um, DCP. So I know DCP and has been working with um, the Department of Transportation DOT thinking about these issues about parking. Um, but I don't know if Joe, you want to take a stab or that or kick it over to DCP to talk about that. Yeah, I'm happy to do both. I mean, we've been working with DCP and, and our uh, elected partners and stakeholders on this process uh, for a while now. I've been involved myself since 2018. And I know it goes much longer than that. On this particular project. So, um, you know, with regard to parking, it is a question we get. We hear a lot from folks as we're out and about in the community ourselves. And we've heard as part of the visioning exercises that we've participated in each of the station areas with uh, the Department of City Planning over time. The, the scope and budget for this project does not include parking. Now, you know, we're delivering the new service and the new stations, the four accessible stations to uh, the Bronx. This is a transit equity project. Um, we do understand that folks are interested and concerned with parking. We are not uh, precluding parking, you know, future development or investment in parking uh, with this project. You know, our, our ears are open and we are, you know, a willing partner um, with the city in this. I know the city has been taking a good hard look at first mile, last mile uh, at each of these stations. Um, we've also heard from some of the areas, for instance, um, you know, when we met, met with um, some of the various community organizations about interested parties, um, you know, developers who may be interested in bringing parking to these areas. And our transit-oriented development team is all ears for that, and we're, we're happy to engage and have those conversations. Each of these station areas will have, um, you know, dedicated pickup and drop off areas, what, you know, the uh, commuter rails call kiss and ride areas where folks can be picked up and dropped off, um, you know, carve outs in those areas uh, so that they are not, you know, hopefully adding to what can be otherwise already congested areas. Um, so we are considering that, um, you know, one of the reasons why we're delivering this service to these, you know, these four areas is because it is what we would consider a transit desert. And I'm sure, you know, the folks who live in these areas are, you know, appreciative of the fact that there are not a lot of transit options, but in certain areas, there are some transit options that will help get folks to and from. Um, and then I guess the, the final leg of the stool, if you will, is we just recently engaged, when I say we collectively, the MTA, in a Bronx uh, a bus re network redesign exercise in that area. This service is not anticipated to come online until 2027. You know, so we're going to take another good hard look um, at that bus network and see what needs to be tweaked in order to accommodate the new um, traffic to the new stations. And when I say traffic, ridership traffic, um, and whether we need to consider shuttle service or altering the bus routes. So all of this is on the table and all of it is being considered as we, you know, drive towards revenue service in 2027. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, DCP, anything to add there on just the parking issues? We did receive several comments about, about parking and how we'll resolve that. Yeah, of course. And um, yeah, we've we've heard the concern also like at our at our info sessions, like um at the end of last year. Um I think as 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 Joe O'Donnell also said from the MTA, is like we're looking here to to bring transit to areas that haven't had um uh, great transit access right now. Uh, also with rerouting buses and to also with our work to to like that aims to create more complete neighborhoods where people uh, hopefully also have to rely less on 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 their cars to get around and get to the places where they need to be but we also recognize that you know you do need to for certain things need to drive to get to work if that's not close to transit and as part of our environmental review we're taking a really hard and extensive look at at like from a general traffic point of view and a big part of that is also parking so some people might have seen in their community in like park chester van ness or morris park that uh, our consultant was doing counts of uh, how many parking spaces there are right now and how to utilize and we're taking a really hard look at uh, the amount of parking that is needed and how it's utilized and and, and if that's enough with uh, with the changes that we're making here so yeah we we hear your concern and, and we're currently studying that and at the end uh, of our environmental review we'll also again engage with the community on that and with elected officials as part of the, the public review process yeah. great thank you so much okay i'm going to move to another question um 
that is kind of similar, um, but we had a lot of questions from folks in Co-op City um, asking about a shuttle bus um, to get to the station. Is that something that's been part of the conversations? And apologies, I'm, I'm tracking a lot of the questions, so apologies if Joe or Tun, you already answered that. Well, uh, I mean, to the degree that, yes, we're going to take a look at it as we get closer to revenue service, whether we need to implement a shuttle or whether we need to take another look at the Bronx uh, bus network, which we just recently unveiled the new redesign. Um, you know, we have heard things, uh, you know, there are there is some existing uh, parking, uh, large scale parking in Co-op City. So there has been some talk and we've heard from public about the possibility of shuttles running back and forth from the parking, especially around the, the mall area. Um, and as I mentioned, we did hear from folks in the Co-op City area, um, uh, River Bay Corporation actually, um, you know, floated the idea of private investment in parking. And we've got our uh, our transit oriented development team working or uh, uh, working on that, um, depending on where that might be. You know, there could also be shuttles back and forth from there. So um, nothing definitive yet, but all of that is on the table. You know, we do have a little bit of time yet before we get to revenue service, but it's all being considered now. Um, so that we're not late to the game when trains start running. Thank you. And I see we have um, a few questions from Amina Begum in the chat. Um, wondering, or I guess I do answer live here. Okay. Um, there, just a little bit about the, the station design. I think there's some questions here. Um, so are there going to be proper waiting areas at the stations? What type of seating is envisioned at the stations? Um, you know, can we speak to the cleanliness and safety and how all of that's going to be addressed? Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, um, not to pass the buck. I work for Capital Construction, the folks who are going to be delivering the stations in the new service, and that'll be up to Metro North ultimately to decide once we get to service. Um, obviously, they'll have planned that out before we get to service, but um, there will be obviously station maintenance. Um, there is going to, you know, cleanliness and safety is a big priority for us and for, for Metro North. You know, we've heard this quite a bit from, from the general public. You know, each of the stations will have video surveillance systems. Uh, there will be electronic access control systems, elevator management systems, because all of these stations will be ADA. So there will be stairs and elevators as part of the vertical circulation elements. Um, there's going to be a fire alarm system and emergency help points, a public address system. Um, as I mentioned, remote maintenance, uh, monitoring systems, obviously uh, fencing, lighting, uh, around the pedestrian access and, and exit points. Um, and I think Tron mentioned uh, a couple of these stations are also going to have overpasses, which are going to connect literally and figuratively uh, opposite sides of the track that have been historically divided. So there will be, you know, lighting and safety features throughout those, those areas as well. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, and another question here, which I think is a, a really good one. Um, you know, I think it's, it's kind of difficult for folks, I think, to envision the stations just coming in, right? Um, part of where the stations are coming in are surrounded by things like mechanic shops and maybe places that don't feel that safe. Um, I will put a plug in for the future visioning sessions where we're really gonna try to dig in and help members of the public wrap our, all of us collectively wrap our heads around what this might look and feel like um, once development starts kind of being informed by the station development. But um, DCP, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, I know you showed some of the those visions um, or the the renderings of what the stations might look like. Um, can you talk about kind of timing, like how that typically works out? I'm thinking like the station comes in and then, you know, how long do we typically see development start to happen after a, a zoning change? Yeah, that's that's a really good that's a really good question. Um, it will happen over it will happen over time, um, and it's hard to predict them for which of the properties. Like you know, it covers a bigger area around the stations, and it might just you know you'll have a, a lot of different options for future development to go and which site will develop at what time. We don't know. Some sites might never uh, um, you know develop under under the proposed zoning. Um, but we we will see like that's what we use for environmental review purposes is that we make assumptions of like how much development we can expect to see 
come online in the next 10 years. Um, like, you know, what we said about ULURP expecting to start in at the end of this year, um, you know, assuming ULURP will be completed sort of mid 2024, then like after that, um, potentially uh, property owners could make use of, of new zoning, but, you know, construction takes some time too. So starting from like 2025 until like, the far future you will see development come online and we use some assumptions to sort of gauge when that will be but that's very much like assumptions for analysis purposes it, it will develop over it will develop over time yeah thank you so much um yeah oftentimes we talk about we don't have a crystal ball for development but we this is why we disclose environmental impact statements we had the scoping meeting in january to give a sense of when these things might happen. So I know it's a lot of information. We're gonna to continue to help break that down for members of the public moving forward. But I, just to kind of give you a sense, this stuff doesn't just magically happen, um, but we do have lots of tools and we've seen how these tools can, can really affect positive change. Okay, I'm gonna take a little break from the MTA um, focused questions um, for the moment. Um, I want to switch over to jobs because we also received a lot of questions about construction um, of jobs and how folks in the community can connect to those jobs. And I'm actually going to kick that one over if we still have council member Faria still on being that she's the chair of economic development. Um, I'm not sure if she's still on. I'm yeah. here. Um, great. Do you want to take that one? We, I mean, to get a little bit of specific, we had how are these construction projects going to enhance the in community? Um, there's been a little bit about a $40 an hour for local hires, for construction workers. How do we create union jobs? How do we connect jobs to folks in the community? And yeah. maybe we could talk a little bit about how we negotiate commitments and think about that. 100%. Thank you so much um, for kicking it to me. Uh, and and if council member and chair Salamanca can also chime in after me, that'd be great because he's done a lot more land use negotiations than I have. Um, but realistically, that is part of our engagement process of what we are going to hopefully be able to get from community members to hear what we need in these housing projects. Whether I you know I, I flushed through some of those questions as well and saw that people say they. We're in need of a school because we have congested schools. We need community centers. We need open space. And really um, what that means is where we ask for square footage for commercial, commercial spaces or where we're building development, um, that is the, the negotiation we need to have with uh, the, each of the developers in each of these projects on um, the type of, of development they're having, whether the building is glass or brick or whatever that actually can turn into what unions we bring in or what types of sectors, private sector workers can come in to do some of that work. Um, and there will be a give and take negotiation on each of these projects um, in terms of pipeline creation for the housing developments and what unions we can bring in to make sure we're hiring local. And then I think on the other side of this, DCP, um, MTA, Metro North have been doing a lot of different citing uh, for what types of jobs and titles they'll need um, to create each of the stations. They are not new to this, um, so they'll know the titles and, and um, be able to bring local hiring in. I think a question that I don't necessarily have the answer for, but we have time to plan for is um, how do we ensure that we're getting local people if it's not bringing in a local union in the development that can ensure we're hiring local in terms of the um, creation of the stations themselves that will be worked out with the agency partners um, and which uh, titles get RFP'd and who we bring in to, to um, work those jobs. And if Chair Salamanca can chime in to fill the gaps, because I know there are definitely gaps that I've missed. No, thank you, Council Member. I, I think that something that we, we will be focusing on in the negotiations is how do we work with the MTA to ensure that the general contractor that they select is actually hiring locally. Um, I, I, and I know that the MTA just hired a chief diversity officer, a new chief diversity officer, a Latina woman from the Bronx, uh, which, you know, we do plan on bringing her in and having these conversations with her. Um, you know, it's important to know that 
those individuals, those union jobs uh, that um, that would be readily available uh, for these stations um, are, are, are local union ind individuals that are in these unions um, that work locally. Um, and, and I do know that when we're negotiating this project, you know, that's gonna be one of the top questions that's gonna be on top of our priority, not just the council members, but when it goes through the EULA process, community board, borough board, city planning, we're gonna give testimony to city planning. You know, in the city planning commission, we have a Bronx rep there. Um, a former chair, a council member is the chair of the city planning commission. We will be having conversations with him, putting the pressure on the MTA to ensure that they have job, um, job fairs, job forms for local residents to ensure that they get these jobs. And as you know, and there is a commitment from me as your land use chair, as we're negotiating this, that that is part of the uh, memo of understanding uh, 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 that we uh, that that we put together when we're voting on this project. And I'm pretty sure you know we we will be working also with with different or you know organizations uh, that that focus in uh, on job employment, uh, such as BOEDC, um, you know, and other not for profits in our community that are laser focused on these jobs. Thank you so much, um, Council Member Salamanca. Um, and then I think that we had the Deputy uh, Bronx Borough President, Janet Paguero, who wanted to add to that as well. Thank you so much. And just to add on to Council Member Amanda Farias and our Council Member Rafael Salamanca, perfect segue. Um, the Higher NYC program, uh, as mentioned, is a free program that's run by NY uh, EDC and our councilwoman oversees uh, NYC EDC. And so we know that that's something that we could embed and encourage um, Higher NYC to implement when they're speaking to developers. Uh, just recently, Higher NYC was moved from NYC SBS, the Department of Small Business Services, and now it's completely being overseen by uh, the Economic Development Corporation, we, which gives us leeway to ensure, again, uh, we have our champion who oversees this agency, um, gives us leeway to ensure that when we are implementing the higher NYC initiatives, that for this particular project, that we hire locally and that that's embedded in our negotiation. So I know that our councilwoman would champion that effort. Thank you, Deputy. Thank you so much. Um, okay, we've got a lot of questions related to um, kind of how the the Metro North Line will operate. Um, so, what, again, we're going to be putting together an FAQ that I think will really clearly break down answers to all these kind of general questions. I know MTA has a ton of information on their site, so we'll drop that link in in the Q and A as well and follow up. Um, but Joe, can you just run through? Um, you know, what line this is going to connect to. And then we, I also have a lot of questions coming in about what the fare will be. Um, like what's, what's I, I should say what line it'll connect to, but can you list maybe some of the stops up in Westchester and beyond that, that this new expansion will, will connect to. Um, and then maybe you could talk a little bit, like, will it be open seven days a week was a question. What will the fare be? Will there be any discounted fares? Sure. Some of that information is known today. Some of it is is not known, obviously, because service is still a ways off. Um, so that would be Metro North again, who would be setting the fares and providing, you know, the um, the service planning in 2027 when when things um, are up and running. But what we do know is that um, as we get closer to completion, is when they're going to set the fares based on uh, the economic climate and what's going on at that time. Uh, what we do anticipate and what MNR Metro North is contemplating is a discounted ticket similar to what Long Island Railroad does with their city fare ticket. Um, you know, so there is uh, a discounted fare that's being contemplated again, uh, too soon for me to say, and, and sort of out of school for me to speak as to what Metro North is ultimately going to, where they're going to land in 2027, but that they are considering those type of, of options, similar to what Long Island Railroad provides. Um, as far as the service and, and what it's going to run, um, it's anticipated that uh, this will be, uh, obviously this will be running on the Hellgate line. Um, when service first starts, it'll start um, and, and terminate in New Rochelle at the New Rochelle station. So uh, folks coming from points north in Westchester and Connecticut uh, will transfer at New Rochelle and then take the Hellgate line into Penn Station. 
Um, there, there anticipates that there will be three Metro North trains per hour in each direction to start, which is consistent with uh, Metro North service to other uh, Bronx stations. One will start and end in Stamford, and the other two will start and end in New Rochelle. Um, in the off-peak, Metro North plans to run two trains per hour in each direction, um, one starting and ending in Stamford and the other one in New Rochelle. So you'll be able to transfer um, from points beyond, nor you know, north of Stamford at Stamford, um, and then you'll also be able to transfer um, from other areas at New Rochelle in order to get into this new service. Um, the initial service, as I mentioned, will require a transfer in New Rochelle. Um, and then once it goes, uh, you know, south of there, it will be on the Hellgate line. Thank you so much, Joe. And sorry, can you reiterate again when anticipated um, the stations will actually be open? And so will they all open at the same time or is it going to be yeah. staggered? No, great question. So each of the station's construction has its own timetable. So uh, they are not all anticipated to be, you know, completed on the exact same date, but service will not start until uh, all four stations are complete. Um, so completion of all four stations is anticipated right now for 2027. Um, and then once all four stations are complete, that's when we'll start up the service. Great, thank you. And again, we'll follow up with more info. Um, so it's all in writing here for you. And we've got a lot of questions answered in the Q&A as well. I think we're going to give an output of this as, as well, because I don't think everyone's, I know everyone's actively listening here, so might not have the opportunity to read through everything. Um, I'm getting a lot of questions, or we're getting a lot of questions about jobs. What types of jobs are going to be created? Um, how local businesses will be impacted? Um, council Member Farias and other council members, um, BP's office, DCP, no, I'm kicking it to everyone, but I think part of it is you know, we might have a sense of some of the jobs that might come. I know there's been questions about a school as well. Um, we've got overcrowding in schools, and I believe that the environmental um, documents show that we probably will need a school in this area. Um, so maybe we can, maybe we'll start with the school piece, and then we can um, talk about the local jobs and the other community facilities um, that might be coming through this project. And I think, you know, a lot of this will happen during this negotiation process that over the next few months, better part of the next year, really. Um, so we can we can speak to that as well. But maybe Tun, you could talk about the school. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, I think it's it it's similar to what I mentioned before about parking is that, of course, like with these proposed land use changes, they, um, you know, will have certain impacts and we're studying that those impacts right now uh, as part of our environmental review. Um, that's an ongoing process and we're looking to go back out with the um, with sort of the outcomes of that analysis and go publicly with that and engage with you all on that uh, later this year. Uh, I think for schools specifically, it's like, yes, we do know about um, that there is currently overcrowding. We do know that, um, that, that there will be a school need and we're studying that right now and also uh, looking at ways to to address or like you know accommodate that school seed need like there will be new development those will be families living there that have kids that go to school and there needs to be you know school seats available for those kids to have an education and we're looking into that and looking how to address uh, that future need um, and again just to sort of build on my earlier responses you know, you'll see development happen in a longer time period. So it's not that, um, you know, everything happens overnight in this area. But yeah, we uh, do need to look at what the impacts will be like later down the road and how we make sure that there is sufficient school capacity uh, for these neighborhoods in the future. And to complement uh, Tan's response, like part of the work that uh, we do, uh, changing, uh, doing changes in the land use, uh, in the city, but specifically in the Bronx, is also um, in order to help bring diverse type of uses, diverse type of um, retail offices, um, industrial areas uh, that allow for diverse type of jobs to come. So we are hopeful that the changes of land use that we are uh, proposing through the change of zoning 
uh, will help bring um, not only construction jobs, but also uh, new retail spaces that people can work on, new office spaces, uh, for example, uh, and all the all the job posts that um, that are within that environment, right? Uh, part of our work is also very important or enhancing the current, the existing medical campus uh, that are in Morris Park. So we're also building on that, hoping that the zoning changes will help bolster uh, the amount of jobs that the area is already uh, providing uh, to the residents of the Bronx. Thank you so much. Um, Council Member Farias, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I they touch the bases of the, the types of jobs and like what we're hoping to see with, with the, the rezoning and with the developments that come. But I, I really want to, to double down on like this is conversation piece one and the important parts uh, that are to come are going to happen over a longer period of time. I think it's really important for everyone to be mindful that like we're not having a conversation in the, like these next couple meetings that people are going to. And then like in January, you're going to get all this construction. It's like over time, these conversations and this dialogue has to continue to happen. Um, and there are parts of this process that will happen sooner than others. And that's why we're engaging people in person. I think these in-person meetings are really where we're going to be able to dive into the more tangible things of, you know, heights of buildings, or do we need square footage for school, or do we want both dual residential and commercial, and what that looks like, where's the open space, do we have enough trees, uh, things like that, um, that really can dive into what we collectively would like to see um, that will help us and give us um, leverage and, and power to negotiate that both with the, the developers and the housing applications, but with DCP and, and work with partners like DCP and MTA and, and um, others to make sure all these investments are coming back into the community and we can make, we can realize as much feedback that we're getting from folks um, in real time throughout this process. Um, and Chair Salmonk, are you still on? I'm sorry. Yes, I am. No worries. Um, I'm just seeing after we kind of talked about jobs that there's some more questions coming in about, you know, how we ensure that, you know, the commitments that we get uh, concerning jobs are honored. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Maybe like how in through other your experience, um, how we've kind of done that on other projects and made sure developers who are being held accountable? What we've done in the past, and I know I've done this in other affordable housing units, um, we've required that the developer hire an outside agency to report back to the community on a percentage of jobs that have been created, local jobs. Um, and, and so that may be, you know, that, that may be something, that may be a requirement that we add uh, to this, um, to this ULERP, requiring both housing development and the MTA uh, to report back to local community boards. Um, and maybe even to the council as to, you know, what was the commitment in terms of percentage of jobs locally and, you know, how they fulfilled those commitments. Um, and I and I also do know, and I know I mentioned her again before, and I mentioned her again, I know that there's something that falls under the chief diversity officer's purview in terms of reporting back to communities. Thank you so much for speaking to that again. Um, I'm seeing some questions about uh, senior housing. I'm not sure um, if there, I forget if there's actually a component where we're requiring any senior housing. I think we would at least try to encourage it here. Um, perhaps one of the council members or DCP um, could talk about that. I know that we're, you know, throughout the city, I, I've been, I've been in my job, my role here at the council for almost a decade and senior housing is something that comes up time and time again. Um, I will note that um, HPD, which is the Department for Housing Preservation and Development has what's known as a term sheet um, that basically will, is something that HPD will engage with developers and will often do this on city owned land when we have that opportunity. Um, 
but to basically make sure that we are creating and developing senior housing, um, there are some unique needs there. And uh, I'm sorry, HPD does have a term sheet for uh, SARA, it's called S-A-R-A. Um, and I know that we've been advocating and making sure we've, we've heard from the community members to advocate for the developers that own some of these sites within the, the rezoning area to speak with DCP about develop, I'm sorry, with HPD, I'm getting my acronyms mixed up, um, about developing senior affordable housing. Um, and I believe that, you know, that's a commitment, not a commitment, but I can't say a commitment at this point in time, but something that um, the council members are committed to creating more uh, senior housing in any ways they can. Um, so and I think, if, yeah, go ahead. If I can add, if, if I can add to, uh, Chelsea, like part of our proposal entails adding more housing capacity to these areas and us doing that also um, uh, involves the mapping of what we call the mapping of new mandatory inclusionary housing areas, which in more simple terms is that um, uh, by us uh, allowing new uh, housing um, resi uh, residence uses in areas that right now they're not allowed or they are allowed in a different density, it gives us the ability to designate those areas uh, for them to be developed with a component of permanent affordable housing. Uh, that said, um, once that is allowed right in paper in, in the regulations, then uh, it comes in a different phase of development and we're really hopeful that these changes would incentivize new construction of housing uh, in part of Justin Vernest and in Morris Park, and hopefully, uh, based on the needs of our borough uh, developers and 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 landowners, uh, will work together with our council members and our elected officials and HPD uh, in order to, uh, for um, be providing housing that is needed, such as senior housing um, in this new area. Thank you so much. Um, we've got some questions related to the Park Chester neighborhood as well as Park Chester complex. So I'll start with Park Chester complex. Um, I think there's been some sentiment that we need to ensure that the um, that the existing housing that's affordable to the residents that live there remains affordable to them. Um, so I guess this is a falls under the bucket of housing preservation. Um, can we talk a little bit about, because we know that the Parchester complex is massive and, and right there, um, can we talk a little bit about um, what's envisioned um, for the, the residents there? Um, and Council Member Fernius, maybe you want to talk a little bit about your commitment to preserving affordable housing, and then maybe we can ask DCP to kind of talk about what's go going on around the, the development. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I mean, I, I'm fully committed to ensuring that we have affordable housing options, including senior housing. Um, as many purchaser residents know, we just had a 100% senior housing building um, uh, be built and about to open um, recently in the within the Parkchester campus. Um, and I have expressed time and time again about affordability and um, looking at other options, whether that's veteran housing, having a percentage of people that were that are previously unhoused, um, and having affordable options for them and keeping affordability rates within our de the development that will come. Um, so I'm fully committed to doing that and ensuring that we um, are able to build housing for residents um, that are within our community. Um, on top of that, I am in consistent communication <laughs> with HPD and Parchester management um, on a plethora of issues that are happening on the Parchester campus in, itself um, and how to ensure affordability, um, maintenance, uh, home ownership, and, and, and all of the above um, for the current residents and stakeholders um, that live within the Parchester campus right now. Um, and and that's that's my commitment. It will be so going forward and until I'm kicked out of the council. And um, I'd love to hear 
DCP talk a little bit about the application that we have uh, currently in front of us? We had specifically, um, what are the plans for the empty lot at Unionport in East Tremont? Yeah, what I can say about that, about that specific property is that it, it is included in our work uh, in, in that area that you saw uh, as part of the presentation. Uh, it's been vacant, I think, for a while now. There used to be a, 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 a gas station and, and a shopping center with a lot of different storefronts. I think that now it's like, I think it was demolished like probably 2018, 2019, and that's been, that area has been vacant. I know that uh, environmental remediation uh, was done there. And um, I think from like our vision, like our land use vision for, for, for the area in general, but especially also for like a larger site or like opportunity site there is, uh, is to see housing. It's close to the future station. It would have, uh, and maybe, maybe Joe O'Donnell from the NTA can speak more to that, but there's another separate entrance off of Union Port that would give uh, direct access to uh, to the station uh, directly from that specific site on the corner of Union Port, White Plains Road, and East Fremont Avenue. Um, yeah, and like I think that's sort of the vision. What what we talked about in the presentation about the land use vision and objectives there is to create housing and density closer to the station, especially on those bigger bigger sites, and and create uh, sort of a quality site plan. Yeah, just uh just to add to what Toon said, the you know the entrance or the station at Parkchester Van Nest. Uh, there will be the main entrance, which what we would consider the main entrance at East Tremont Avenue. Um, and then there would be an added entrance um, off of Union Port Road, uh, a secondary entrance. Um, most of these stations, the, the Hunts Point Station, the Morris Park Station, uh, both have entrances on the north and south sides, respectively, of the station, which, you know, again, help bridge uh, the gap on the other side of the station in this particular station, Parkchester Van Ness, you have the um, the Con Ed substation there. So we wouldn't want to send people over to that side of the, the tracks, if you will. Um, so the secondary entrance is at Union Port Road. Um, similarly, uh, for Co-op City, there's one main entrance on Erskine Place there because the other side of the tracks goes off into uh, park wetlands. So uh, again, not where we would want to send folks off to. So. And I just wanted to, to just to tag on really quickly, this, this part of the conversation is really important for folks to come to the in-person meeting and to talk about what they want to see. Um, that includes the type of housing you want to see in these projects. So um, make sure to come out on the third and, and the future dates uh, to continue giving us feedback of what you folks want to see within each of these either individual um, stations and or surrounding projects. Thank you, council member. And I'll also add, we had a, um, a question come from Natasha in the Q&A, um, kind of bringing up the process question about in-person meetings and if there will be virtual options for those who may have conflicts. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, we're living in a very hybrid world these days, and sometimes it is tough for people to make um, accommodations uh, to actually get there in person. So I can I can feel that question. I think um, we are definitely exploring how to do a hybrid format for almost everything, but it is extremely challenging. Um, sometimes it takes a lot of staff and not to say that's a reason for not doing it. It's just we're rolling this out really quickly and we're trying to accommodate and reach as many folks as possible during this. So we're thinking about different options and ways for people to give feedback in a virtual space as well as in person. For example, tonight, this is mostly a virtual um, a virtual space we're in, but we, we do have community partners actually ho hosting in-person sessions so we can view together and kind of think of it that way. So I just want to assure you that we're committed to reaching as many people as possible and totally recognize that not everybody has the, the luxury really of, <laughs> of making time in their day to actually come out and have a voice in their community. And, and that's as on us as um, as city, as your your public servants in the city of New York to, to make sure we're reaching out to you. Um, and again, we'll keep sending more information as it develops so that you can stay involved in, in multiple ways here. 
Okay, um, we've got a lot of questions, Joe, about funding. So um, I'm not sure, maybe we covered this already, but if we could just remind folks, you know, how much this cost, where some of the funding has come from. Um, someone's bringing up that, I have Michael in the Q&A bringing up that, uh, will, will Connecticut DOT kick in any funding like they do for the existing New Haven line surface, service? Anything you can speak to on, on that front? So yes, th this project is fully funded. Uh, the project was awarded in January of 2022 to a joint venture of Helmar International LLC and Railworks. Um, they were given their notice to proceed uh, in, in mid-January of 2022 and, and got ahead, you know, fast started on their work. Uh, the vast majority of the work in 2022 and early in 2023 was, uh, a, you know, finalizing planning. Uh, we had presented them with about a, approximately a 30% design, which they needed to um, confirm our presumptions and then advance. Um, so they had spent a lot of 2022 finalizing those plans and the designs. And then here in 2023, um, they've started after a lot more work. I mean, the beauty of this project is that it takes place largely inside the Amtrak right-of-way. Um, also, the flip side of that coin is, is that we're very beholden to Amtrak for access and oversight because everything that we do inside, you know, they are the, the landlord, if you will, or the owner of the right-of-way, and we're going to be a tenant there. Um, so we need to seek oversight and, um, and cooperation from Amtrak on all this thus far. Uh, that's been relatively good. Um, in 2023 here, we had a long-term outage agreed to with Amtrak from uh, March through September 1st, which was uh, to allow us to advance critical work downstream uh, on, a, on an area that some of you may have heard me talk about before if you've been involved in any of our previous updates on the project uh, at Leggett Interlocking. And an interlocking is a complicated piece of track work, which allows us to switch trains from one track to the other. Unlike a car or even a tractor trailer truck, trains can't just turn. They need to be shifted from one track to another. And by advancing that legged interlocking, it allows us to shift Amtrak trains off to other tracks so that we can do work more efficiently and safely upstream uh, without fear of having a train bearing down on us. So we're getting into much more detailed work now, You know, much more um, inf uh, infrastructure work. Uh, with the anticipation of getting going on some of the stations at the end of this year and the first quarter of next year. Um, so folks will start to see more stuff in their relative communities. But the good thing, as I mentioned, is um, this is largely inside the the existing right-of-way. So there are not a lot of external impacts to the community. Uh, but the project is funded and underway. There was an additional um, uh, amendment to the project budget uh, for the uh, reconstruction of the New York Rochelle Yard to accommodate this work, um, you know, so uh, I, I can get to the final budget numbers on that, but it is fully funded. Great, thank you so much. Um, and that's a great question we'll cover in the Q&A as well. Um, we've also got a lot of questions around traffic. Um, so there's a lot of specifics, some really great feedback, and we're definitely gonna take all of the specific feedback and help to use that to en engage um, the larger community during our public workshops to really think through these really specific details um, and kind of understand how folks, you know, move through this area through their different modes of transportation, whether it be car or bike or your two feet um, or however many feet you might have. Um, and, but I do keep seeing something about the I-95 on-ramp um, and then about the connection also to Pelham Parkway. I'm sorry because I don't uh, drive in this area, so I'm not super familiar with this, but we can definitely dig in on the, the community visioning. But um, DCP, I don't know any conversations with DOT or maybe MTA when you've spoken with DOT about the traffic congestion, um, where that's showing up and how we're thinking about those connections to the major um, thoroughways. Yeah, sure. Um, I think it's around traffic um, and, and circulation, it's, it, it's twofold. We, like what was outlined in a presentation, we've starting in 2018, have had community engagement to look at, um, you know, identifying improvements to the public spaces, to the public realm, including, uh, um, you know, improvements that would help uh, make it more safe and accessible to get around these areas, go to the future stations and back to the neighborhoods where people live today. 
Um, I think that's one part of it. And um, we're working, um, uh, we haven't only like identified those improvements, we're working uh, also with other, with the community and with agency partners, um, um, you know, to flesh that out. Uh, and at the same time, as part of our environmental review process, it's sort of similar to what I said about parking is that we've heard concerns. We, we, we do know also from my own experience that, you know, the network here is not always great. It's hard to get around if you're in a vehicle. Uh, you know, you might also for bike and pedestrians, like th their improvements needed. Uh, and we've heard that throughout uh, the years of engagement, but also, for instance, at like the info session last year. Um, and right now, as part of our environmental review process, um, we're again studying not only parking, but also um, looking at traffic. And that's traffic not only for cars, but also for pedestrians, for bicyclists, and for all modes of transportation, uh, how to get around the city and the region. Um, so yeah, we, we've heard those concerns and, and, and we're studying it right now what the impacts would be and how uh, they can potentially be addressed in the future as well. Deputy VP, did you have something to add? I see your hands raised. Yeah, I just want to expand on what um, Tan mentioned. You know, just generally, uh, this is a, a project that has to go through full environment through the full environmental impact uh, review and statement, which uh, analyzes every aspect of topics such as traffic and everything related. I think the broader undertone is any environmental impacts such as traffic, parking, air quality, noise, public health and, and public safety um, to open spaces and schools. And so um, we know that this project went through a public scoping process, which was essentially a public hearing for the initial environmental review, um, but the project will be required to mitigate any issues specific to any areas that have um, impacts uh, related to environmental issues outside of traffic. So I know that this is something that we'll be paying close attention to. So thank you for that, DCP. Thank you so much. Um, I'm seeing a couple questions about how do we ensure the housing will be for Bronx residents. Um, I will note that there is um, something called community preference. That means for affordable housings that go through the housing lottery, um, that 50% of those are set aside to be available for the community district in which the, the development's located. Um, DCP, can you clarify, I should know this off the top of my head, but are those um, for MIH units, the mandatory inclusionary housing set aside for the, the development? Um, do those get and um, have community preference as well? I think that's that's more of a question for HPD. So I, I think okay. that we would come back to that at some other point. Okay, great. So we'll make sure to answer that in the FAQ and at future visioning sessions as well. Um, I'm seeing a lot and I'm, I kind of wish we had DOT here now that I'm seeing a lot of these questions and we'll make sure to get them engaged on, on future sessions. But um, we're getting, you know, I guess there's there's probably a ton of city agencies that we'd love to have involved. And I know DCP and MTA have really been talking to a lot of those agencies and have a wealth of information around a variety of talk it, uh, topics here. Um, but public safety is really coming up quite a bit. Um, we, so I just wanted to, um, you know, I know that's come up through the process because we've been doing years of engagement around um, both of DCP's planning efforts as well as MTA's planning efforts. Um, so I just wanted to see, you know, what's come up so far and, and how uh, DCP has been thinking about addressing that through the physical environment. And then we also will need some programmatic elements to ensure that folks feel safe alongside the new development. I mean, I think there's a few ways that we kind of look at this and Tun, you should definitely step in as well. But um, we, of course, um, spent the last several years talking with residents to understand where are places that they are concerned, whether that is um, different types of public safety, whether that's um, uh, safety with um, vehicle safety. Um, so we've spent a lot of time kind of having those conversations and mapping that kind of out together in those workshops that we've been doing. Um, and then in addition, we look at that from with our with our partner agencies, 
um, as well as um, through our, you know, our analysis um, from that data that we have. So with all of that information combined of the lived experiences that everyone um, expresses within the workshops and we hear from elected officials, um, as well as with the information that we can connect through the data that we collect um, through our partner agencies, we use that to really think through what are, what are some um, ways that we can address these issues. Um, so, um, you know, we'll continue that conversation through the through the Euler process and, and really want to make sure that we're hearing everything and, and accounting for that. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. And just, like, just to add, I, I, I do think in terms of, like public safety, like there like the concerns that there are that there are um, again, as also the deputy borough president mentioned, like we're looking at the impacts at, at all levels. So on a very basic uh, level like are there enough police officers in the precinct if you have more people living in this area in the future i think that's just like a very simple uh, or not a simple but like like that's just like the, the simple explanation of what we're looking at and aside from that i think a lot of our planning work around these future stations along these corridors is also to allow for uses and people living there to get more activity around the clock and to have a more complete neighborhood along these corridors so that you'll see at East Fremont Avenue on a Wednesday night in 10 years from now, more people on the street maybe that you see today. And also with the improvements that we've identified to have well-lit underpasses, to have more street lights and crosswalks just for people to get around more safely uh, around the week, like throughout the week uh, in their neighborhood and getting uh, to and from the stations. I think that's a really important part of, of our work. That's not so much about studying impacts, but just what the work itself tries to achieve here. Okay, hey, thank you so much. Um, Council Member Velasquez, did you have a question? I sure do. Um, so I've had uh, multiple constituents reach out regarding not only um, City Island access as the district is is pretty large so district 13 is pretty large and while we are getting direct um, stations in van nest and morris park um, adjoining is co-op city which is closest to city island and so their concerns are what does a um, park and ride look like and they have submitted as well as uh, our offices have submitted some suggestions as a location that is a parks owned property uh, for it. But in addition to that, um, with discussions with the mayor's office, we have often talked about the Harbor Patrol and expanding its units. Is this a community benefits agreement point that they can submit so that we can negotiate for that? Thank you so much, Council Member. Um, you know, as myself, been having been through a few um, rezoning processes in my time at the Council, um, you know, I will just kind of share with everyone, it's amazing that you're all here tonight and plugging into this information. This is exactly where you want to be to make sure that the issues are being addressed. Your elected officials are listening to you. Um, obviously, there's you know, we can't do absolutely everything. You can't, we say in city government a lot, if you make every one person too happy, you're not doing your job right. But we um, are listening. This is a balanced proposal um, that we wanna continue to engage the community on. There are three community boards that touch this rezoning area. Um, they will be, have a wealth of information about the proposal and are going to be another resource for you to plug into as well. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll keep moving on. We have a ton of questions here. Um, so apologies. Thank you for being patient with me as I, I try to sc scroll through all of these. Um, we had some questions about um, building heights, um, especially around the Park Jester development. Um, can, can we speak to those? That's for DCP. Is there, is there a specific question? Um, I think in general, you know, when, when we think about design and think about how we can best to suit the, you know, the experience of people who are living there, we're constantly thinking about how different, um, just different aspects of how the building feels in the neighborhood is important. And that comes through a lot of the urban design work. Um, Alexandra, I don't know if you wanna add anything more to that, but I, 
you know, I think we take into factor of like what height feels like, how big the building feels like um, as somebody who's walking down the street. Um, so I think that's a really important aspect that we consider. Um, so that's how we kind of anal analyze what, what kind of height is in the area. Yeah, we have some yeah. folks kind of referencing the renderings that were shown earlier. Sorry, Alexander, go ahead. No, that's, that's fine. I think um, uh, uh, when we when we start thinking about how to change the land uses in an area, we also take um, a deep consideration about the form of the buildings, the buildings that will house those land uses, and the location of heights um, are really important for us in a sense that um, they inform uh, how we all walk, walk uh, around the city, uh, what we see as nodes or as centers of activities versus uh, when um, there's a transition uh, to more um, residential and calm area. Um, we also take a look at the width of the streets. Um, obviously streets that are narrow, that their width, uh, for example, are one lane or two lanes. Uh, the treatment is different from ones that are uh, more, have a more avenue character. And the other aspect that we take into account is um, the public realm network, uh, as well as the very active uses that could um, inform the shape of the buildings. All of this to say is that um, uh, in city planning, but in general, as an urban designer <laughs> that I am, uh, for us, it's very important that the shape of the buildings uh, allows you to recognize where you are in your neighborhood, uh, where you're located, when, where do you want to go. Um, and for, for full disclosure of heights, I, I would totally recommend um, participating in the public review process. So we'll start our after the certification that will happen in, uh, in the late fall. Um, because um, we also would like to hear uh, the public input in how we have ambition, uh, how uh, these new, de new developments in the long term uh, will help uh, the shape of the neighborhoods. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Um, and just to kind of piggyback a little bit off of what you were saying, I think, um, you know, zoning is very technical. The zoning resolution is an extremely technical document. A lot of what we try to do is break down what it all means and what it's going to feel like in your neighborhood. And that's why we have folks that are urban designers, are maybe former architects, are planners um, to really help for the for the general population um, understand you know, how, how this all plays out in their neighborhood. I will say I have the, the I don't know if that's gonna show up, but it's the DCP zoning handbook um, that's available on their website that really helps you to understand a term like FAR, which means floor area ratio. What is that? That just basically is a number that tells a developer um, basically how big their building can be. A height limit is a different, another tool that's a little more straightforward. It's a, what we call a contextual district. So these are all just terms that are going to be um, thrown around. I'll make sure to put some resources on our website for folks to um, under, understand all of this stuff better so that we can really engage in meaningful conversations through the public review process. Okay, so I know we're kind of getting late on time. I, I know we didn't get to all of the questions. Um, I did have a, one one come in, Joe, that's pretty straightforward. Will, will bike parking be included in the train stations? And will bike parking be a uh, part of any of the new developments? So yeah, there will definitely be dedicated bike parking at all four of the stations uh, for, from this particular project. As far as the rezoning folks, I'd have to defer to DCP on that. But yeah, the four new stations will all have dedicated bike parking. Yeah, and about new developments, there are uh, citywide uh, bike parking requirements in place that, that would apply here. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a lot of kind of common themes coming up in a lot of these 
um, these questions. Um, so uh, just to kind of go through those real quick, you know, I think we have, um, you know, fear of gentrification, which always comes up when we, we talk about planning in New York City. We know that we're in a housing crisis and that it's a very complicated and sensitive topic to, to discuss. Um, we know that traffic congestion is an issue. We know that parking is an issue. Um, we know that this is a lot of change, a lot of really positive change, but positive change doesn't, you know, you also have to think about the unintended, unintended consequences of that positive change. Um, I know there's a lot about jobs. There's a lot about how we make sure that our existing businesses that are now thriving, that we can ensure that they can continue to thrive with, with the new development and, and, and new um, stations coming in. Um, we've got a lot of questions about just the logistics of um, how, how the Metro North will, will specifically um, be more accessible to Bronx residents, right? Like I, I'm seeing a lot about discounted fares. I'm seeing a lot about um, people making sure that they can get to the station um, and that, you know, that's not going to come with an influx of of tons of traffic. So there's a ton to be, you know, there's a ton that the agencies have been thinking about for years, right? We know that this has been in the works for a really long time. There's been a lot of engagement. Um, so with that, I will um, basically start to wrap it up here, but I just wanna make sure I give the elected officials in the room um, a chance to, for some closing remarks. Um, so I'll, I'll kick it over to um, Chair Salamanca. Thank you, uh, Chelsea, for uh, really uh, moderating uh, this um, this important important session. I want to thank the City Planning Commission (DCP). Uh, I want to thank MTA. Uh, we obviously have a lot of work to do, talking about affordable housing, gentrification, traffic, uh, parking, job creation, ensuring that there's local jobs. Um, and I look forward to having these conversations as we move forward with this unit process and these negotiations uh, to ensure that. We are, uh, we are speaking and, uh, and addressing each and every one of these issues. Uh, and with that, I, and I, I just specifically want to thank the Land Use Division uh, for spearheading today's um, info session. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And also want to shout out to the Community Engagement Division um, for making sure that this webinar ran smoothly. Um, Council Member Frias. Thank you. I'll be brief. Uh, I do want to echo the sentiments that Chair Salamanca just expressed, and I'm really grateful for everyone that showed up tonight and asked all these great questions and gave us really great insight to add to the foundation of topics that we want to make sure we address in our future meetings. Um, and I appreciate the agencies coming today and answering questions and giving us some macro scopes of, of some of these things, and I'm excited to have these in-persons to deep dive on some of the, the further questions we have here with you all um, to give some clarity to community and to, and to get more um, feedback to build off of. Um, but yeah, thank you to, to all of you and to everyone at, at the Land Use Division and Community Engagement. Y'all really did us uh, justice tonight with ensuring we can host this for our communities. Our pleasure. This is the best part of the job. Um, Councilmember Velasquez, any closing remarks from you? I want to thank uh, everyone for showing up and uh, there will be continued conversations. This is not end all be all because I know that there are some questions that still remained unanswered. So if that's the case um, and you're affected in my district, uh, District 13, so it's the Van Ness Station and the Morris Park Station, and my city island folks that do have concerns over the co-op city, feel free to email our office and we will uh, send those over to DCP. So that way, when we have our in-person meetings, we will have those questions answered for you. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for showing up. Thank you to all the agencies. Thank you, uh, DCP uh, and Land Use uh, for coming out. And MTA, we won't forget about you guys either. Um, thanks also to my colleagues in government. Um, I'm looking forward to making sure that the Bronx gets its, its due and that we finally uh, get the Bronx building up more and more. So thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening and God bless all.
Thank you, Council Member. And I just want to reiterate too, you know, this is the beginning that we, we haven't even entered the formal public review process. We um, this is really to re-engage the community, make sure you all have basic information and we keep getting your questions so we can ensure that through the public review process, we're addressing all of, all of these concerns. Um, Deputy Barrow President, any closing remarks for you? Thank you so much, Chelsea. On behalf of the Bronx Borough President's Office, we want to thank each and every stakeholder that made today's meeting possible. You heard it directly um, from the City Council land use. Uh, we haven't even entered the formal review process. And so the fact that we're starting ahead of time just speaks to the dedication and commitment of every single representative that's on here tonight to ensure community engagement and ensure that the community's vision is at the forefront of the planning process. And so I want to thank the DCP, HPD, City Council, Land Use, the MTA, my colleagues in government, uh, Chair of Economic Development, uh, Councilwoman Amanda Farias, uh, our, uh, um, uh, Mr. Chairman uh, Rafael Salamanca, Councilwoman Marjorie Velasquez, uh, Council Member Kevin Riley, everyone that was involved. I want to give a special shout out to the Bronx Planner at uh, Bronx Borough President's Office, Jason Horseman, who I know was working behind the scenes, super extremely dedicated um, to bringing this to life. This is a project that tackles the transit inequities of the entire borough of the Bronx. There are particular neighborhoods where we will have amazing and beautiful stations, but this is uh, speaking to the core of the historical disinvestments that we've seen borough wide and so we are committed to ensuring that the community's voices that our residents voices again are at the forefront of the planning process and we truly look forward to our in-person uh info session so thank you thank you thank you gracias a todos de nuevo estamos aquí para eh, asegurarnos que la comunidad tenga parte de este proceso, que sea parte de este proceso. Y estamos comenzando ahora antes del proceso formal para dejarles saber a todos que estamos que estamos planeando con la comunidad eh, en, el, en el centro eh, de, de estos proyectos. Y le quiero dar las gracias a todo el mundo, a mis colegas, a los concejales. Eh, esto para ellos es personal y yo sé que van a seguir abogando para nosotros allá en, en City Hall. Muchas gracias y buenas noches. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm not sure if DCP or MTA wants to say some closing remarks. Um, but if if nobody unmutes, I'll just close. Yeah, go ahead, Alexandra. I, I just wanted to thank everybody for participating, for having us here. I just also wanted to echo and reiterate the fact that, um, you know, this is uh, the beginning of the engagement, certainly on the, the ULURP side. But, you know, we certainly have been out um, with DCP and our elected official partners uh, and stakeholders in these communities for a while now. So um, we are here for the long haul. We're here to listen. We're here to collaborate and participate. Um, you know, so thanks for having us. Thanks, Joe. Alexandra? Yeah, what, I wanted to share the same sentiment. We're really excited uh, to be reaching this next phase of this uh, plan, this study, this community planning work that we have conducted for the past five years uh, with the borough uh, residents and now with this, um, with the elected and with our um, sister agencies. It's just a really exciting time to be planning around a new infrastructure work that hasn't, arri hasn't arrived in the borough uh, in almost like 50 years. So I want to thank everyone for making the time uh, on a Wednesday night away, for, away from their families to be here to learn more about this process. And I am hopeful that we will see you again and you will bring your friends, your family, as the borough president said, uh, to all the upcoming events and especially um, to the formal public review uh, so we can get your input in shaping this plan. Eh, les quiero agradecer a todos por participar hoy en la sesión. Esperamos eh, que les haya gustado, que ha sido informativa, que haya servido para que se conecten o continúen eh, estando conectados con el trabajo que se ha estado haciendo en la planificación alrededor de las estaciones eh, que van a venir nuevas al Bronx. Eh, casi luego de 50 años tenemos este nuevo, eh, esta nueva infraestructura que va a conectarnos no solo más con el centro de la ciudad, pero 
con nosotros mismos. Es un plan que incluye la creación de viviendas, la creación de empleos, eh, Esperamos también las mejoras en cuanto a espacio público, en cuanto a todos estos espacios en los que todos nosotros nos encontramos. Y espero que esta sesión haya sido lo suficientemente informativa para que eh, haga el espacio de participar en el futuro. Los esperamos en el, en, en el proceso formal de consulta pública que va a iniciar eh, a finales de año y esperamos de que con todo gusto podamos acomodar eh, todas sus preguntas, todos sus comentarios y todas sus opiniones y su input va a ser súper importante para que este plan al final, en 5 o 10 años, sea exitoso y responda a todas las necesidades de eh, todos ustedes. Gracias. Thank you so much. And I'll just end with one, one final statement, which is, you know, city government, we don't always talk to each other when we should. Sometimes we operate in silos. And this is really, I'm not saying that's what's happened here whatsoever. I think this has been an amazing collaborative effort. And just to have, it's just such a wonderful thing to have multiple agencies, multiple electeds all together unified to ensure that we're engaging the communities moving forward. So I, with that, I thank you all so much. Eight o'clock on the dot. Have a beautiful evening. And we will hopefully see you on October 3rd um, for our first big, or not first, but from this fall 2023 engagement, um, first in-person workshop. Thank you so much. Good night.